We are on session six today, and we're going to be looking at communicating the gospel part one. So we looked at what Islam believes, what Muslims believe, and then we looked at uh, some of the objections that Muslims will bring against Christianity, that Jesus was not crucified, there is no trinity, Jesus is not the Son of God, um, and so all of these things. So we need to learn and be able to go over, I encourage you to go over those notes, because that's what I need to do, that's what you probably will do, is go over these notes again and again and again, and just refresh your mind and your heart. And, um, and then let God use you. But today we're going to start um, our class on communicating the gospel. Okay, so I'm going to give you some important things that are going to help you how to communicate the gospel. Really, some uh, how to reach the Muslims with the gospel and to be able to take what we know and then communicate that gospel to them. So let's, let's start off on, in the, on page one here. At the top, it says, remember, a few things I want you to keep in mind. This is so important as we go out and as we do Muslim ministry. The first thing is keep the gospel central. Keep the gospel central. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You see, when it all comes down to it, it is the gospel that we need to communicate to the Muslims. It is the gospel, it is the salvation that is through Christ alone that is going to save them. Nothing else. We might be able to win the argument, but lose the soul. And if they don't come to Jesus, that is really what it's all about. It's about them being able to see Jesus more clearly. And so that's why we learn what are the, their objections to the gospel, so that we can begin to tear down those walls because once again, they believe that you believe Jesus is the physical Son of God. So what do we need to do? We need to tear that down. No. They think you believe in three gods. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's not what any Christian believes. So we have been called to tear down and then to build, right? To build on a foundation of the gospel. So this is very important. That's what Paul said. Okay, Lord, are you speaking? <laughs> okay, uh, look at this. The, some of this, I, I quoted here the words of Ravi Zacharias. I thought this was really insightful. <clears throat> he says, always remember in ministry to Muslims, the gospel is the main course. Apologetics is the seasoning. You do not want too much seasoning, otherwise it makes the main course insipid. An argument may remove the doubt, but it is the Holy Spirit who can convict of truth. You see, it is the Holy Spirit ultimately that's going to do the job. You can only do so much and you present it, but leave it to the Lord. We must leave it to the Holy Spirit. Let's communicate clearly. And he says three things here that Ravi Zechariah says. That Muslims understand the necessity for Christ's atonement. They have to understand that. Number two, the grace received is to forgive and transform, but not a license to sin. See, a lot of Muslims hear that Christians say, well, I just accept Jesus into my heart and I, I say the sinner's prayer and I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And they think that that is a license to sin. And so now you can live however you want. And so I've had a lot of Muslims come to me and say, so you can just lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, and you're still going to heaven because Jesus told you you're going to heaven and you can do anything you want. And I've had to say, no, not at all. Our forgiveness is not a license to sin. It's to transform me and make me free from sin because now I don't want to sin. Now I've been changed. I've been transformed. But see, they need to understand that. The grace of God, what is it? What did the grace do? And thirdly, we are not inviting them, the Muslims, to commit shirk. What is shirk? To associate partners with God or believe in more than one God. Remember, that is what they are assuming shirk is, that you worship three gods. And so when we are saying, believe in Jesus, we are, in their mind, inviting them to commit tritheism, to believe in three gods, and we are not doing that. So we, we must communicate that to them. 
Another thing to keep in mind is the urgency of reaching Muslims. There is an urgency. And just look around us. As I said in our first class, just look around us. Go outside and see the Muslims are coming by the multitudes to our land. And what are we going to do about it? That's the question. What are you going to do? Because it's not the world's job, it's the church's job. And if the church doesn't do something about them, then they will perish. And the question is, how can we let that happen? So I know my responsibility is I can do, I can take the gospel to them, even if that's one person. And see, this is where I like to break it down and make it practical. Are you willing to reach that one person? But it's when we are closed off and when we are not open and willing to also take risks. Guys, you're going to have to make yourself go out of your comfort zone. You know, it's about getting out of our comfort zone. Yes, it will feel uncomfortable and, oh man, should I go? Should I go talk to them? You may be the only Christian that they ever meet. But sometimes if we have this idea and say, well, somebody else will talk to them. What if not? What if not? That would be a, a fearful thing on the day of judgment. And so we need to take this into consideration, the urgency. What did Jesus say in John 9 verse 4? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. So there's an urgency about what we, we are going to communicate to the Muslims. <clears throat> and a third thing to keep in mind is we are called to love the Muslims and speak the truth, even if it offends. Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 15 says, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but speaking the truth in love. We have been called as the, the body of Christ, as Christians, to love, to love the Muslims. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter if they don't know my language or I don't know their culture. I have been called to love them. And I've been called to tell them the truth. And remember, the truth will offend. Remember, the cross is a stumbling block. If it doesn't stumble, then you have not preached the gospel. That is very important. If it does not stumble somebody, oh, the deity of Christ, the crucifixion, the sin issue, if that is not stumbled upon, then maybe we are not preaching the gospel. And that goes for Muslim ministry. That goes for the church. When people, you know, when people are offended, it has to be the gospel that offends, but at the same time, it cannot be my personality or my character that offends. Because if I offend that person because of who I am or the way I am, then that's something I need to change. The gospel, it's not changeable. This is an old message. This is an ancient message, and it doesn't change. It's the same cross, the same blood, the same call to follow Jesus that Paul preached and that Jesus gave to us. So we need to just preach it. But remember, love Muslims and speak the truth. And please, my brothers and sisters, when you hear other friends, other Christians around you, they might make, because I've heard, comments about a Muslims or about, man, we ought, you know, we ought to do this, you know. You know, I understand the, the anger that we can feel or how the hurt we can feel when people are being, you know, tortured and Christians are being persecuted. I understand, and that hurts. But if we are biblical, we are not called to say, God, destroy them. We are called to say, God, save them, you know. And there is, there is a real, so I just want to encourage you, when you hear others speak up, say to them, you know what? The Bible says speak evil of no man. The Bible says pray for your enemies. Pr love your enemies. Does this look like love? No, it doesn't look like love. You know, and so sometimes we have to do that. I've done that before. And you know, sometimes your friend might say, you know what? Thank you. I, I, I didn't see that when I, when I said that. I said it, but you know what? You're right. But we need to speak up, you know? And sometimes we just hush, hush. We need to encourage one another, you know? So, before we move on, though, 
um, Billy was just noticing my, my outfit here, okay? So I want to just explain a little bit. So this is uh, typically a traditional outfit that a man would wear in Morocco, okay? So this is called a jalaba. It has a hood here, all right? So you can see like the ladies, this is, they're wearing, I can tell they're wearing a jalabas. That's why you see like a design here. And you have different designs, different colors, different, you know, all that, all sorts of things. They have thinner ones. They have thicker ones. I had in Morocco a one made of wool, very thick. You wear it in the winter, you know. So the men typically wear this. This is something ancient. And when you, if you go to Morocco or through North Africa, the men usually wear jalabas, and so do women. They wear a jalaba too. With it's more like has flowers and some more decorations. But um, this is a traditional Moroccan wear. And then also I have my shoes. I don't know if you can see them, but uh, they are like this. They are not comfortable. <laughs> People ask me, are those comfortable? <laughs> not really. Um, but and of course the reason why they're s slip on slip off is because they go into the mosque. So when you go into the mosque and when you go to pray, and because they pray five times a day, the easiest shoe to wear is not one with shoelaces, but you can slip on and slip off and you walk into the mosque. So that's what they wear. These are called the bilghas, and this is called the jalaba. Okay? So, and then next week I'm going to wear something else that they wear in the, in the Sahara Desert. Okay, so I'll wear something different. So let's go on now to the uniqueness and the supremacy of Jesus. This is very important. The uniqueness and the supremacy of Jesus, contrasting Jesus with Muhammad. When we communicate the gospel to Muslims, one of the most important things is it all comes down to two people. It comes down to Jesus and Muhammad. It's so easy just to get lost in all of these things, but let's talk about Jesus. And as a Christian, if I am in the Bible, I should know the life of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So really, we're just going to talk about His words. What are the words of Jesus? The life of Jesus. The miracles of Jesus. Okay, everything about Jesus. And then let's look at Muhammad. You know, so when you compare one to the other, you see a huge contrast. So we're going to focus on this for a moment. So the first point I say is major on the majors. Don't major on the minors. And that's why I said that because it's so easy to get lost and start talking about, you know, well, well, well didn't this happen? And, you know, he, he did this and did that. You know, stick with Jesus. Who is Jesus and who is Muhammad and what did they do? So let's look at that. The central figure of Islam is Muhammad. Everything rises and falls upon who he is and what he did. In Islam, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, the most exalted standard of character among humans and a beautiful pattern that should be followed by all who would seek after Allah. Okay, you have to remember that. Keep that in mind. The life of Muhammad, his words, his actions, the Quran says that he is the perfect pattern, the perfect example to all humanity. So we have to work with that. And yet in Christ, Christ is the perfect example. In fact, Jesus Christ, He is the image of God. And that's what we want to communicate to them. See, in essence, when it all comes down to it, we have no problem. We don't worship a man. You see, just as the Muslims say they worship only one God, we worship God. Jesus is God in the flesh. We worship one God. Okay? We worship God. We have no problems. But when we contrast their lives, we're going to see a huge difference. In the Christian faith, it is Jesus Christ who is central. As Christians, we believe not only should we imitate His life, the life of Jesus, His words and His works, but Jesus was the eternal God manifested on earth as a man. Jesus was and is the exact representation of God on earth in visible form. If we want to know exactly what God is like, look at Jesus. See, for us, it's very, it's very simple in a way. If we want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you wonder how would God act towards His enemies, look at Jesus. How would God act towards a woman? Look at Jesus. 
How would God act with the religious Pharisees? Look at Jesus. Everything is there. How would God act towards sinners? Look at Jesus. You see, we, Jesus reveals to us who, who God is. So, we're going to start off with the unique and unparalleled and miraculous life of Jesus. So these are some very strong points to keep in mind. Number one, when we talk about Jesus, in the prophecies of the Old Testament. Okay, his birth. Guys, the birth of Jesus is prophesied. It says, you, O you, Bethlehem. I believe it's Micah 5.2. Micah 5.2. It says, You, O Bethlehem, though you are little among the, the, the towns, yet out of you shall come a ruler who is going forth is everlasting. Okay, this is a prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. His life, it's in the book of Isaiah. It's in the book of Psalms that the life of the Messiah would be that of healing the sick, the lame. Okay? His ministry, Isaiah chapter 61, I believe, where it says that he will preach a captives. He will, he will set the, at liberty the captives and he would bring healing to the lost and healing to the blind. His ministry was proclaimed and, and prophesied. The suffering of Jesus was prophesied. Isaiah 53, uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions and the, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. See, it's all prophesied in the Old Testament. The death of Jesus, Psalm 22. The resurrection of Jesus, Psalm 16 and other places. It's all prophesied in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before Jesus. The second coming of Jesus is prophesied. Again, in Isaiah and through the, the, the minor prophets, you see that. It speaks of the one coming whose, whose robe is dipped in blood and whose, whose feet has, has tread the winepress of the wrath of God. It speaks in Zechariah of him coming upon the Mount of Olives and it's splitting into two. Okay? It says, we will look upon him whom we've pierced, and every eye will see him. It's in the Old Testament. Who in the world, which prophet ever had his birth foretold, his life, his ministry, his suffering, his death, his resurrection? Unparalleled. This is Jesus Christ. He stands alone. Look at his birth, guys. His birth is miraculous. For, first of all, I said the place. The place was prophesied in the Old Testament. The fact that Jesus was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. This boy's name, this boy, this baby is called God with us. That's pointing to his deity. This child is God with us. He is Emmanuel. And he, the fact that he was born of the virgin, this is very significant. Why? Because he was sinless and he had no human father. He was, not, he was not conceived as a human would be conceived between a father and a mother and therefore the sin passing on through the father. Look at the angelic proclamation. No human in history has ever had the angelic proclamation as Jesus did. Proclaimed to Mary, the angels came proclaiming to the shepherds, right? And then look at Joseph's dream. Even in Joseph's dream, the angel Gabriel came and declared to him that he would have a son. Look at the worship from the Gentile wise men. Remember, these wise men came from the east. We don't know how many. Remember, they brought three gifts, but they could have been 10, could have been 20. We have no idea. But we know is what they brought. But they came and worshiped him. From the east, they may have been Asian. They may have been Arabs. To me, this is a beautiful picture of the nations coming to worship the Jewish king and to bow before him. Awesome. Look at the testimonies of others. So not only do we have all of this, but then we have the testimonies of Elizabeth, Zacharias, Simeon, and Anna. All of this only around the birth of Jesus. It's amazing. Only around the birth of Jesus. There's so much that is pointing to who this person is, that he is unique. He is the Son of God. 
Next, we look at the life of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus. Think of his sinlessness. The sinlessness of Jesus, the fact that no other human was born without a father. Now, Muslims will say, yes, but Adam, Jesus is like Adam. And they will normally compare Jesus to Adam. But I will say, yes, that's true. Adam was born without a father and a mother. But did Adam sin? Yes, he sinned. Jesus never sinned. And I will say to them, tell me one mistake or one sin or one error that Jesus committed. They cannot. They will normally agree with you. They will say, yes, you're right. He was pure. And so Jesus was sinless. Jesus received worship from men. Remember the several times falling at his feet and worshiping him. He received worship from demons. Remember the demon-possessed man who said, do not cast me, throw me into the abyss. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus healed the sick, the lame, the blind. He raised the dead. He walked on water and commanded the weather. Who else has the power to command the weather? Simply by His word. He said, peace be still. Jesus cast out demons. Remember about Muhammad, the different accounts on when he was receiving his revelation. His own wife, his friends were afraid of him because they saw that he was demon-possessed when he got these revelations from Allah giving him the Quran. And yet Jesus, the opposite, he cast out demons. He was not controlled by demons. Then Jesus had total authority simply by his word. We see that. Without using aggression. Total authority. Look at his death, even in the death of Jesus. What did he do? When he was on the cross, the Bible says he gave up his spirit. There is nobody that has the authority to tell your spirit to go. Jesus did because he's God. He gave up his spirit. He dismissed his spirit. He is unique in his resurrection because Jesus died and for three days was in the grave. But on the third day, he rose again. He conquered death. In the book of Revelation, Jesus, in his own words, he says, I who was dead and now alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus has the, those keys. He's unique in his ascension. Jesus, from heaven he came and to heaven he returned. Jesus ascended. And so we need to ask some questions about Christ's uniqueness. And it's important to ask Muslims those questions. So we might ask things like, well, let me ask you, why was Jesus born of a virgin? Why the virgin birth? Why is that necessary? Why was every human through history born normal with a, with a father and a mother, a sperm and an egg, but Jesus was not born from a man's sperm and an egg. He was born of the virgin. And you have to direct them. You have to lead them to understand why the virgin birth. What about the first messianic prophecy in Genesis? The seed of the woman. This is an amazing prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, where God says the seed of the woman, from the seed of the woman would come the Messiah. And, and God says, and he will crush the serpent's head, though the serpent will bruise his heel. So we know that that prophecy is speaking of Jesus, speaking of the, the third person. This is an amazing prophecy, and you have to read that with them and explain that to them, that this was important, that Jesus was sinless so that he could be our Savior. Because without being sinless, he could not save us from our sins. Is it significant that Jesus was sinless? Is God telling us something? See, we have to make the Muslims wonder and ask those questions. What are the differences between Adam and Jesus? Well, look at Romans 5. In Romans 5, for example, it, tells about, it talks about Adam. Through one man, sin entered the world. And through sin, death entered. So through Adam, as sin entered the world, death came to all. But the Bible says, but through one man, Jesus, came everlasting life and righteousness. And through his one act, redemption. Okay? So completely different. 
Death, life. Okay? Sin, righteousness. And then also you can see uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. It talks about the earthly man or the earthy body compared to the heavenly body that we will receive in heaven. And then he talks about Jesus, that Jesus is not of this earth, but he is of, of, from above. He is heavenly. See, Jesus, he entered this world, but he was not created. God simply put him in the womb of Mary so that he could be born of a woman and born as a human, but he entered our world by means of the birth, okay? And Jesus is from above. Jesus is the heavenly man. Muhammad was born of a father and a mother. Every man in history was born of a father and mother, but not Jesus. Now, let's contrast Jesus with Muhammad. So first of all, Jesus claimed equality with God. He said in John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. And it says there that the Jews took up stones to stone Jesus because he made himself equal with God. See, they understood that that statement was a statement of deity, proclaiming deity. And so they were going to stone him. Jesus claimed equality with God. Look with me to uh, Luke chapter 22. And I gave you, we may not look at all these scriptures, but we'll look at a few. But look at Luke 22. Verses 66 through 71. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council. So this is Jesus as he was taken by uh, the priests and the, and the council before his crucifixion. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. <clears throat> then they all said, are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Jesus there proclaiming his deity with God. Now, contrasted with Jesus, Muhammad was only a man. Okay? In the Quran, in Surah 18, verse 110, it says of Muhammad, I am but a man like yourselves. Okay? Muhammad was simply a man. He was only a man. He was from earth. He was not from anywhere else. Then we see concerning Jesus, Jesus was sinless. John 8, 46, Jesus said to them, Which of you convicts me of sin? Which of you convicts me of sin? Now, if you said that or I said that, anybody can convict me of sin because I'm a sinner. Jesus sinless look at Hebrews 7 26 we're gonna if you want to pull out your Bibles we're gonna look at several verses <clears throat> Hebrews 7 26 for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens he's become higher than the heavens that's Jesus. 1 Peter 2, verses 22 through 23. <coughs> 1 Peter 2, 22, speaking of Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered... He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Now, on the flip side, we have Muhammad. Muhammad was a sinner and needed forgiveness. This is Surah 47, verse 19. Know, therefore, that there is no God but Allah, 
and ask forgiveness for thy fault. This is Allah speaking to Muhammad. Ask forgiveness for thy fault and for the men and women who believe. So Allah is telling Muhammad, you need to ask forgiveness for your fault. Now, I have run into Muslims that will tell me that Muhammad had no sin. But what they're saying contradicts what the Quran says. Here you have it here. Surah 47, 19. Now look at this. This is from the Hadith. Okay, If you go all the way to the end of the next paragraph, this is from the Hadith, Sahih Bukhari. That's the Hadith. Volume 1, 711. Muhammad prayed that his sins be cleansed. Narrated Abu Huraira, Allah's apostle, or in other words, Allah's messenger, Allah's apostle, used to keep silent between the takbir and the recitation of the Quran. Okay, so these are two different things that they would do when they pray as a Muslim. There's two different things that they do. And that interval of silence used to be a short one. I said to the Prophet, may my parents be sacrificed for you. What do you say in the pause between takbir and recitation? The Prophet said, I say, Allahumma bayd bayni. Okay, so then it goes on and it gives us phonetically in Arabic what he said, which is this, O Allah, set me apart from my sins, my faults, as the east and the west are set apart from each other and clean me from my sins as a white garment is cleaned of dirt after thorough washing. O oh Allah, wash off my sins with water, snow, and hail. So clearly, Muhammad was admitting that he is a sinner, that he needed to ask forgiveness from Allah. Okay. <clears throat> Next, we see Jesus forgave sin. Right? The paralytic man, Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. The sinful woman that came to him, and she wept over her, his feet. And remember, he said, your sins which are many are forgiven. Muhammad, on the other hand, could not guarantee anyone forgiveness. He could never guarantee. He himself needed forgiveness, but he could not guarantee anyone forgiveness. And of course, he cannot forgive because only God can forgive. Only God can forgive. And actually, in the passage in Matthew 9, we see the Pharisees and the Jews talking among themselves and saying, who can forgive sins but God? You see? Next, we see that Jesus performed many miracles. This is from Mark 7, 37. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And also John 21, 25. On the other hand, Muhammad did no miracles. He did no miracles. This may be surprising to some. However, the funny thing is, is there are traditions and there are stories that say Muhammad did various different miracles. But according to the Quran, he did no miracle. So those are actually just fairy tales. Okay, in Surah 17, verse 59... It says, and we refrain from sending the signs only because the men of former generations treated them as false. Okay, what, what it's saying there is Allah is speaking to Muhammad. and He's saying, I am not sending you any signs for you to do because the other generations before didn't believe them and they treated them as false. Look at the next one, Surah 17, verses 90 through 93. They say, <clears throat> we shall not believe in thee until thou cause a spring to gush forth for us from the earth or until thou have a garden of date trees and vines and cause rivers to gush forth in their midst carrying abundant water or thou cause the sky to fall in pieces as thou sayest will happen against us or thou bring Allah and the angels before us face to face or thou have a house adorned with gold, or thou mount a ladder right into the skies. No, we shall not even believe in thy mounting until thou send down to us a book that we could read. Say, and then, so you're saying this, but Allah says you need to say this. Say, glory to my Lord, am I aught but a man, a messenger? 
In other words, am I anything but a messenger? I can't do these miracles. These things that you're saying, I can't do them. I am only a man bringing you a message and that's it. And that's it. Next, we see concerning Jesus that Jesus knew what was inside people's hearts. This is something that only God can know because only God is omniscient to know all things. In Revelation 2.23, And all the churches shall know that I am He, this is Jesus speaking, I am He who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. And there is another verse too there in John, John chapter 2. On the other hand, Muhammad did not know hearts. In Surah 11, verse 31, I tell you not that with me are the treasures of Allah, nor do I know what is hidden, nor claim I to be an angel. Next, Jesus didn't use aggression and forbade his followers. Matthew 26, 52. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter 9. This is a, I love this verse. <clears throat> so we just read this passage where the enemies of Jesus are coming to arrest and take Jesus and Jesus refuses to fight them because you see the very opposite in Islamic history. Now, once again, in Luke chapter 9, verses 51, 51 through 56. <clears throat> now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him. Okay, the people of Samaria, they rejected Jesus because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So this village rejects him rather than turning around and destroying them or telling them, gather an army, let's burn them all and behead them all because they rejected us. He says, you don't understand what spirit you're from. I didn't come to destroy men, but to save men. So let's go and keep going to another village. The very opposite is what you see in Islamic history and what you see in the life of Muhammad when he went from Medina to Mecca. As he grew in his following and one by one, campaign after campaign, going, destroying, and fighting against the infidels. Now, on the flip side here, Muhammad used aggression and urged his followers to do so. In Surah 4, verse 84, Then fight in Allah's cause. Thou art held responsible only for thyself, and rouse the believers. So Allah is telling him, this is a command, you must fight them, and you must rouse the believers. Cause everyone else to fight. Next one, Surah 2 Verses 190 to 193. Look at what it says. Fight in the way of Allah against those who fight against you. Okay? So imagine, remember Jesus, there he was. They were going to take him, attack him, arrest him. And then Peter pulls out his sword and he says, put it away. Okay, so contrast that. Fight those who fight against you. But begin not hostilities. Lo, Allah loveth not aggressors. <laughs> and slay them wherever you find them. Okay, to me, this is a bit of a contradiction here. Allah loves not aggressors, but the very next sentence he says, slay them wherever you find them. 
and drive them out of the places whence they drove you out. For persecution is worse than slaughter. Okay, what does he mean by that? If you are persecuted by the enemies, that's worse than you slaughtering them. It is better to kill them before they end up persecuting you. Okay, persecution is worse than slaughter. And fight not with them at the inviolable place of worship until they first attack you there. He's speaking about the place in Mecca. But if they attack you there, then slay them. Such is the reward of disbelievers. But if they desist, then lo, Allah is forgiving and merciful. And fight them until persecution is no more. And religion is for Allah. But if they desist, then let there be no hostility except against wrongdoers. So it's very, it's very clear. <clears throat> and there, are, there is a, a, a brother on the website there, I can give it to you, where he has an article. There are 164 verses on jihad in the Quran. 164 verses. And one after one you can read them. But you see very clearly the aggression and the encouragement to fight and to kill. Jesus next, Jesus taught against avenging our enemies and he taught us to love them. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. That's the exactly opposite of what we just read, right? When they fight you, you fight them. Jesus says, no, I tell you not to resist an evil person. <clears throat> but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Matthew 5, 38 through 39. And then in Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. You will not find one verse in the Quran that says love your enemies. No. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. <clears throat> On the flip side, Muhammad taught revenge and hatred against enemies. Surah 2, 2, verse 194. If then anyone transgresses the prohibition against you, transgress ye likewise against him. Next one, Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and his messenger, but if they turn back, Allah loveth not those who reject faith. So if they do not accept your message to obey Allah and His Messenger, then He says, God, Allah does not love them. God does not love. He does not love unbelievers. Next, we see that Jesus received the blind, lame, and poor. Let's look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> beginning with verse 35 then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging and hearing a multitude passing by he asked what it meant so they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by and he cried out saying Jesus son of David have mercy on me then those who went before warned that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God, and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. We have, on the other hand, Muhammad rejected a blind man and was rebuked. This was something he did. Now, he was rebuked by Allah, and then he asked God to forgive him. But nonetheless, he did it because he sinned. This is in Surah 80, verses 1 through 10, um, I, I don't have the whole, all of those verses, but I have this verse here. It says, The prophet frowned and turned away. 
Okay, the blind man came to him in the story and he turned away from him because there came to him the blind man interrupting, of him wast thou unmindful. So this is Allah rebuking Muhammad saying, you were unmindful, you rejected this blind man. <clears throat> Jesus, we see that he loved and he received sinners. Next, we see about Jesus that Jesus taught monogamy. Okay, he taught monogamy. In Matthew 19, that passage there on marriage and divorce, verses 4 through 6, remember what Jesus said, Have you not read, the two shall become one flesh? And we know there are other places, other verses, but Jesus clearly taught marriages between a man and a woman, two becoming one. Muhammad taught polygamy, himself having 13 wives, and in the Quran, permitted sex with slave girls. In Surah 4, verse 3, Surah 4, verse 3, If ye fear, now remember, this is the words of Allah, If ye fear that ye shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, Okay, now what does it mean, the orphans? Remember, there were battles and wars where they fought and killed people. So when all of those men of the unbelievers died, they were left, all of their women and their daughters were left, the daughters, orphans. So that's what it's referring to, those that they lost all of the men, the husbands, the fathers. <clears throat> so he says, if you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, marry women of your choice. Okay, notice how Allah is saying this so very flippantly. Marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if ye fear that ye shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one, or a captive that your right hands possess. Okay, that was speaking of the slaves because they took slaves. Your right hand possess. That will be more suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. So according to the Quran, and any Muslim will tell you this, because I've had many discussions with them. So according to this verse, they are permitted to marry up to four wives. Only, the only condition is they must treat all four equally. This is exactly what a Muslim will tell you. They must treat all four wives equal, and they must provide for all four equally the same. So this is a very interesting discussion. Because see, what happens is, once again, as a Christian man, and of course I'm, I'm a married man, I see the Quran and the Bible in a very different light. I see, as I study the Bible, as a spiritual book, and the Quran as a very physical, very fleshly book. So this is looking from the eyes of the physical. And when you talk to them, everything is focused on the physical. So you need to focus on four, you need to treat them equally, Provide equally. So I said, I've said to them, okay, well, let me ask you this question. How can you love every one of those wives equally? How can you love? You ask those wives, how do they feel? Have you ever gone and asked a man who's married to four wives if they feel equally loved? And how are you equally loving them? Because see, when it comes down to the spiritual issue is God never created it that way. Just as I have one God, I also have one wife. The Lord also revealed that to me. I have one God. And God says you cannot serve both God and mammon. You see, God is one God. He wants all of my love. Just in the same way in the human relationship, I have only one wife and she has one husband. I cannot divide my heart. And so this, to me, it is not from God. And so I've had very good discussions with Muslims about this. But this is where they get the, the doctrine that they can marry up to four wives, okay? But yet a, wife, a woman cannot marry four men. Yeah. Okay, so wait a minute. Where is the equality here if it's equal? Okay, because the Muslims will say, Islam came into the world and brought equality where it was not. Okay, yeah, well, you're, if you're comparing that time in that area, in that desert where there was polytheism and they threw their women and their children into the fire, you're comparing that. But go into the world and see Christianity and if they saw what Christianity taught and what the Bible taught, they wouldn't say that. But this is what they will say. 
Now, look at the next one. This is a long one. Surah 33, verses 50 to 51. O prophet, lo, we have made lawful unto thee thy wives, unto whom thou hast paid their dowries. Okay, so now remember, Muhammad married 13 wives. But the Quran says you can marry only four. So wait a minute. How is that? <clears throat> but look at what Allah tells the Prophet, tells Muhammad. Prophet, we have made lawful, we have made lawful unto thee thy wives, unto whom thou hast paid their dowries. And those whom thy right hand possesseth, possesseth of those whom Allah hath given thee as spoils of war, and the daughters of thine uncle on the father's side, and the daughters of thine aunts on the father's side, and the daughters of thine uncle on the mother's side, and the daughters of thine aunts on the mother's side, who emigrated with thee and a believing woman, if she give herself unto the prophet, and the prophet desire to ask her in marriage, a privilege for thee only, Okay, only Muhammad had this special privilege. Look at what it said, that, that sentence. And a believing woman, if she give herself unto the Prophet. So you can marry more. He's saying you can marry if a believing woman, if a Muslim woman comes up to you, Muhammad, and says, I want to marry you, marry her. Go ahead, marry her. A privilege for thee only, not for the rest of believers. We are aware of that which we enjoined upon them concerning their wives and those whom their right hands possess, right? Whenever it says whom their right hands possess, it's speaking of the captives, the slaves. That thou mayest be free from blame, for Allah is ever forgiving, merciful. Thou canst defer whom thou wilt of them and receive unto thee whom thou wilt, and whomsoever... Thou desirest of those whom thou hast set aside temporarily, it is no sin for thee to receive her again. So anyone that you desire, you can have. That is better, that they may be comforted and not grieve, and may all be pleased with what thou givest them. Allah knoweth what is in your hearts, O men, and Allah is ever forgiving. Clement. I guess clement must mean kind or merciful. I've never, never heard that word used, <laughs> but this was in the English translation. <coughs> so this is what the Quran teaches and this is what Islam teaches. Contrasted. Jesus, next. Jesus came to save lives. We read this previously, Luke 9, 56. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. Our Lord Jesus came to give us life. He came as the good shepherd to give us life. And yet the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, Muhammad, we see in the life of Muhammad that he destroyed lives. In this surah, which is surah 9, verse 29, the Quran says, Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So well, Muhammad was commanded, fight them. And it doesn't say if they fight you. It just says fight them until they believe. So no matter where they are, if they don't believe this message of Islam, you are to fight them. And last, we see Jesus died voluntarily. He resurrected, he ascended, and he is alive in heaven. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus said, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Unlike Jesus, Muhammad died 
and was buried like any mortal man. His tomb is in the city of Medina in Saudi Arabia. But our Lord Jesus is in heaven. He's ascended and he's at the right hand of the Father. <clears throat> the next thing I want to look at is the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Let's turn to those in John 6, 35. And let's look at these. And I encourage you to please try to memorize all of these I am statements. There's seven of them. Seven statements that Jesus made in the Gospel of John where he declares himself something that, that directs us to who he is. It's a self-description of Jesus. First one, John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jump down to verse 48. Jesus again says, I am the bread of life. And you can actually read this and actually speak to a Muslim concerning the story because Jesus talks about the story of the wilderness. When Israel was in the wilderness and God gave them manna from heaven. But Jesus says that was not the true manna. The true manna is what my father sent down and that's me. <coughs> Excuse me. The next one, John 8, 12. <coughs> John 8, 12, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the one that gives us light, light to our soul. Next one, John chapter 10, verse 7. <clears throat> 10, 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And jump down to verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. See, Muhammad never said that anyone who comes to him will be saved. That is only reserved to God. This is Jesus speaking. Next one. The Good Shepherd, John 10, verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And then jump to verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. See, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd cares for the sheep. A shepherd protects and a shepherd provides. That's what a shepherd does. And he says also, a shepherd will give his life for the sheep. <clears throat> Next I am statement is John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? You see, Jesus said, if you believe in me, though you may die, you shall live. I am the resurrection and the life. Muhammad could never say such words. John 14, 6, we all know this one. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 15, <clears throat> verses 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And once again, if you read these words or quote these words to a Muslim, 
is Jesus a vine? Is he an actual branch? And he says, we are the branches. No, he's speaking spiritually. So what does he mean? That if I abide in him, I will bear much fruit. Shouldn't that be in God? Yes. But Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus is claiming deity through every one of these seven I am statements. And see, when you're able to memorize these, these are the words of Jesus. Do you believe Jesus is a true prophet? Yes, I do. Then Jesus said this. Do you believe him? Yes or no? Put them on the spot. Would Jesus lie? The Muslim will say no. Then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did Jesus say it or not? Okay. Jesus said it. This is his word. He said it. And he said that he is the only way to God. So these are the I am statements of Jesus. Next, let's look at the uniqueness of Jesus and the second coming of Christ. In all three monotheistic world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it is Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, which means deliverer or savior, who is returning to establish his kingdom. It's interesting to discover the title Messiah of Jesus is also used in Islam. However, if asked to give the meaning of Messiah or Messiah in Arabic, they will have no answer. You see, it's amazing, but in all three religions, world religions, they are each waiting for the Messiah. If you go to Jerusalem right now, when I went years ago, on the opposite side of the Wailing Wall was a banner that said, the Messiah is coming. The Jews are waiting for the Messiah. We're waiting for Jesus, the Messiah. And even the Muslims are waiting for the Messiah to come back. But who is the Messiah? And what does his name in Arabic, Messiah, which is Messiah, what does it mean? Ask a Muslim. We know what it means. It means deliverer or savior. But savior from what? You see? Deliverer, what does he deliver us from? You see? I am not a deliverer unless I deliver you from something. There is a danger. There is something I am delivering you from. So, that is Jesus. Now, we're going to move on to the next area that is very important. And if you learn this, this is, this, this is so crucial because this is what we need to communicate to Muslims. And this is what is called the scarlet thread of redemption. This is the principle of blood atonement. <clears throat> okay, so follow with me. The Bible is a book of redemption. History is His story. The story of God's redemptive work on earth. Now this paragraph here is taking, uh, you can see at the end, from the New Open Bible, a portion in it. God's story of salvation and deliverance for sinful and lost mankind. The idea in the word redemption is twofold. It refers to a deliverance and it refers to the price paid for that deliverance, a ransom. Our Lord's redemptive work for us is threefold. First, it is closely related to forgiveness since we receive forgiveness through the redemptive price of Christ's death. Second, it involves justification, since the deliverance establishes us in a restored position of favor before God. And third, it promises final deliverance from the power of sin at the coming of the Lord. This redemption is the scarlet thread. Okay? The scarlet thread. From Genesis to Revelation, there is that scarlet thread. There is the thread of the blood atonement, which unites the whole story of the Bible. That is what is amazing. This book that was written thousands of years ago by many authors on, over a span of time and over many continents, and yet it has a single message, the message of redemption. But this is unknown to the Muslim. They don't understand God's story of redemption. Now, the Bible says in Leviticus 17, verses 10 through 11, 
And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So if we're going to communicate to the Muslims the fact that there is no forgiveness of sin, there is no way that I can enter heaven, there is no way that God can put me and bring me into a position of favor, there is no way unless there is shedding of blood and unless my sins are washed away. No one's sins can be washed away except through the blood of Christ, okay, the blood of Jesus. But what we are going to look at is that this is a story that God is taking us from throughout the whole Bible. So, it starts in the Garden of Eden. So this is important because if you talk to a Muslim and you talk about this, you need to be able to share it in a way that they can understand. So that's why we need to know the stories of the Bible and know the story of redemption. Okay? So it begins in the Garden of Eden. So look at Genesis 3.21. We know that God created Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden to tend the garden. But man sinned, both Adam and Eve, sinned against God and disobeyed. And as they sinned, they, the Bible says that death entered into the world, right? And they were cursed. And so what does it say in verse 21? Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Okay? God, though they were created perfect, and they were created obviously without clothing, naked, but yet now sin entered the world, and because of sin, shame. And now the Bible says that God made for Adam and Eve tunics of skin. Where did those tunics come from? skin an animal so the very first person to shed blood was god god initiated the blood he covered their <coughs> covered them and started the story to direct man that it will be god who will cover your sin it will be god who will cover your shame because really it's the shame of their nakedness. And this was God. So look at Almighty God was the initiator of a blood sacrifice. He was the first and the last one to make an atonement for sin, right? When Jesus died on the cross, it is finished. <clears throat> the first Adam was created perfect, but willingly sinned. The last Adam, Jesus, was born sinless and never sinned. So this is what we need to communicate to our Muslim friends. Adam, sin entered the world. Jesus is called the last Adam, but he came to take away our sin. But look, we see what happened in the Garden of Eden. Next, this is a story that Muslims are familiar with. Abraham offering Isaac, because this story points to the substitutionary death of Jesus. Okay, Genesis 22. You don't necessarily have to turn. Actually, no, turn there. I'm sorry, turn there. Genesis 22. The Muslims everywhere are familiar with this story because every year each family sacrifices a sheep in remembrance of this story. Remember I told you that every year they have to, every father has to take a sheep and sacrifice those sheep. So all through the Muslim world, they're doing this every year, remembering that Abraham offered his son and God provided a sheep, okay? So they know this story very well and, and they are reminded of it every year. But in this story, which is really a pro prophecy of the Messiah, there are many parallels. And it's amazing when you read this and you see it. There are many parallels and foreshadows of Christ. 
A foreshadow is something that points to Jesus Christ beforehand. For example, in verse 2, we see there, Then he said, Take now, God said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. First of all, we have two people. We have a father and a son. It could have been a father and a daughter. It could have been a mother and a son, but it wasn't. It was a father and a son. Then we see in this verse, take your son whom you love. This is the very first, and now this is for us as Christians, this is the first mention of the word love in the Bible. The first time love is used is how? Between a father loving his son. Isn't that powerful? The first mention. And he says, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. So he would be offered on a mountain. Then jump down to verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So they were traveling for three days traveling, Abraham and his son. <coughs> and actually with some young men. It says they were with young men. So he was traveling for three days and it was on the third day of their journey that they arrived. And so it would have been on that day that he went up and then offered his son on the third day. Remember, Jesus died and was raised on the third day. And the Bible, if you go to Hebrews 11, in Hebrews eleven nineteen, it says that Isaac was raised in a figurative sense because really in his mind he was going to die or be raised on that very same day. Abraham didn't know how God was going to do it, but God was going to do it. Okay. In verse 5, we f this, in verse 5, we see the first mention of worship in the Bible. The first mention of worship. He says, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Abraham says, we're going to go. And he says, we're going to worship. And we will come back to you. That's amazing too. Notice he says, we. He doesn't say, and I will come back and maybe we will both come. He says, we will come back to you. Amazing. The faith. And verse 6, verse 6, it says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. So Abraham placed the wood only on Isaac. Who is carrying the wood? The son. And who is carrying the fire and the knife? The father. The father is carrying the fire and the knife. Verse 8. <clears throat> and Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So we see here that Abraham says, God himself is going to provide the lamb. And then in verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Isaac went willingly. doesn't say that he resisted or fought. He willingly went and laid on the altar for his own father to slay him. Verse 13, <clears throat> after he was about to slay his son, right, the angel God calls out and says, Abraham, don't lay your hand on him, for I see that you fear God. In verse 13, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram, a male sheep, a ram, and caught in the thicket by its thorns, by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So we see that Abraham slayed a ram instead of his son. This is pointing to the substitutionary atonement. Jesus was sacrificed instead of me, instead of you. He took my place. God emphasizes three times that Isaac is Abraham's only son. How interesting. Even though he had Ishmael, the son of the flesh, which God never told him to go into Hagar, but he did, and that was the son of his flesh, God said, your, your only son, Isaac. God recognized the son of the Spirit. 
But this is important. Memorize this story. Because when I'm talking with a Muslim, and when you begin to share with him the story, I ask them, hey, do you know the story of Abraham offering his son? Now, you may say Isaac, and if they catch you, they may say, no, 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 it's Ishmael. Because for the Muslim in the Quran, it's Abraham offering Ishmael. But I don't make a, a ruckus about that. Okay, I leave that alone. I just say, do you know the story? And I say, tell it to me. And I'll let them tell me. They'll normally be able to just tell you very little. And then I'll say, well, let me tell you more. And they'll listen. And you tell them the whole story. And then this happened. And you know the father went up. And they went onto a mountain. And do you know what happened? Yes, this happened. He was about to slay. And what did God say? God said, stop. I know that you fear me. And do you know what he saw? God brought a lamb, a ram, for him to take and slaughter. And then you will ask them and say, so what is the significance of this story? And you know what a Muslim will say? God was testing Abraham. He was testing to see if he would obey. You're right. He did test him. But let me ask you another question. If that was all it meant to be, when he was to slay his son and he stopped him and he let his son go, he passed the test. He obeyed God. If he passed the test, what was the significance to slay the ram instead of his son? If it was only to test his faith, that didn't require any faith. It was right there. God was trying to give us a message. He was trying to prophesy to us that one day there would be someone that would be placed in our stead as a substitution. And so you need to point the Muslim to that. Now the next story, which is very important to know, is the Passover. And when you guys have a chance later on, when you have an opportunity, some quiet time at home, read through Exodus chapter 12. But there you have the Passover, you have the nation of Israel is in Egypt, and God says He's going to bring the angel that's going to pass through Egypt, and whoever does not have the blood on the top of the doorpost and on the lintels, the Bible says the angel of death will kill the firstborn of that home. But we see, for example, several things that are important. In verse 5, the lamb had to be without blemish, and it had to be a male. In verse 7, he said to apply the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and lintel. So that was man's responsibility. They had to take the lamb. They had to put the blood around the door. And then in verse 13, it says that when the Lord sees the blood, his judgment will pass over. So it was by the blood of the Passover lamb that the Israelites were redeemed from slavery. You see, for us, it is only by the blood of Jesus that I am set free and I will not be under the judgment of God. See, God will judge all sin. All of His wrath and judgment will come against sin. But if I have the blood of Christ over the door of my heart and of my soul, God's judgment will pass over me. And actually, Jesus says that in John 5, 24. He who hears my word and believes in Him who sent me shall have everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. You see, we have the Passover. But you need to share the story of the Passover. Then we see throughout the Old Testament priesthood and the sacrificial system. We see the blood and we see how God commanded that sacrifices be made for the atonement of man's sin. And then into the New Testament, we see John the Baptist's declaration. Now, a Muslim, when you ask them, they, will, they believe in John the Baptist. And I would ask them, do you know what John the Baptist said about Jesus? And normally they'll say no. Well, in John 1.29, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, this is John the Baptist telling the whole world, this is God's lamb. This is God's provision from heaven to take away the sin of the world. And the people that knew the story of the Old Testament, they knew the story of Abraham and Isaac, they understood who Jesus was, that he was the lamb of God. Then in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus' declaration of himself He says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
And then we also have the apostles' testimony. The, the various apostles, they told us, they gave testimony to the fact that the blood, it is through the blood that we have redemption. Look at Ephesians 1.7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. <clears throat> And uh, Hebrews 9.12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So we need to ask Muslims questions about this scarlet thread of redemption. Why would God require blood sacrifices throughout history to cover sin? Why would He do that? God is pointing us to the fact that there must be a death a penalty for my sin. See, the animal, either the animal had to die or I will die. And so in the Old Testament, God was preparing the people for the Messiah. It was a preparation. And it was a sign to point them to the Messiah. Is God just? Is God merciful and gracious? How can God be equal in both? How can God both be just and punish sin, but at the same time be merciful and forgive my sin? See, there is no forgiveness unless my sin is punished. But how can God do both? Why would God ask Abraham to give his own son as a sacrifice? Why not give of his livestock or of his wealth? God could have asked many other things that he had, but why did he ask his own son? All of this is prophetic. Would sacrificing his son demonstrate the depth of his love for God? Yes, of course. And how did God demonstrate his love for us? It was not by creating the universe and doing all the things that God did. The way God demonstrated his love for us is by giving the most precious gift, giving his own, giving his son as a sacrifice. Another question, has Allah ever demonstrated His love for mankind? Is there anything that cost Him and was very precious to Him? See, the Muslims have nothing to demonstrate Allah's love for them because He didn't do anything to sacrifice. There is no sacrifice. But this whole idea and this whole understanding of the scarlet thread of redemption is, is so important. Because in Islam, you have no shedding of blood. In Islam, nobody paid your price. Your sins, you simply come to Allah and you repent and you ask God to forgive you and He forgives you. But there is no penalty for your sin. Now, we're going to look at the last portion here, the path of the prophets. As we said before, Christians and Muslims have much common ground on which we can meet. This is a great advantage even if we can't agree on everything. Taking a Muslim through the path of the prophets, the history of redemption, looking at the lives of each of the prophets that the Bible and the Quran itself attest to is an excellent way of unpacking truth from beginning to end rather than the typical way of starting at Jesus. So, it is important to understand the prophets because they believe in these prophets. So we are able to look at these stories with them, as we call it the path of the prophets, and once again point them to Jesus. Okay, These are, these are just different ways, as I'm giving you here, the path of the prophets, the scarlet thread of redemption. These are different ways contrasting Jesus and Muhammad. These are different ways you can share with Muslims. So first of all, we have Adam. Adam transgressed against God, and death was the consequence. He attempted to use fleshly means to cover his sin and shame, but we see that it was insufficient. So talk to them. Ask them questions about the story. You know, This is how you get a Muslim to, to converse with you. Because we see, as we know in the story, how they, they covered themselves with leaves, interestingly enough. But God came and killed an animal and provided tunics of skin. 
another, the next main prophet that we have in the story, we have Noah. Noah was righteous, but mankind had become wicked. He obeyed God and built an ark to save his family from God's judgment that was coming. The ark was God's provision to preserve Noah and his family. Once again, even in this story, it points to Jesus. Because God told Noah, Noah, I am bringing judgment on the earth. Everyone is going to perish. But the Bible says in Hebrews that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, which tells me that Noah was warning people. He was telling them God is going to judge this earth, but come into the ark. Come to be saved. Come to salvation. But what did people do? They rejected him. They laughed at him. They mocked him. They didn't believe it. This is foolishness. Oh, what does the Bible say? The message of the cross is foolishness. See, you're inviting people to come and receive Christ. We're inviting people to repent and turn from their sin and believe that God judged His Son for you. And people will either receive or reject. The Muslim needs to know. God was preparing us through Noah. As he said, there was the way, the only way, was into the ark. And guess what? There was only one door. And the Bible says that God shut the door. But Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he warned people. Next, we have the story of Abraham. Abraham believed in God. He was declared righteous by believing, not his doing. Thus, he was called the friend of God. God's promise was fulfilled in Isaac. God tested his love by commanding him to offer his son. And God made provision and substituted a ram. And so we can explain that story and share that how through, through Abraham and through Isaac and through his lineage, the Bible says that the Messiah would come. And it would be the Messiah who would deliver the world from sin. Then we have the story of Joseph. In the Quran, he's one of, one of the great prophets, Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. He was revealed through dreams that he would be chosen by God for a unique and exalted role. Once again, when you know this story, it's an amazing story because you have the 12 sons of Jacob. And out of the 12 sons, one is chosen. There is a chosen one. If you want, there is an anointed one, okay? He is chosen and he's given these dreams by God. He was rejected by his own, right? He was sold to Gentiles. He was purchased as a servant to Potiphar. Later, he was accused wrongfully and he was imprisoned with two other men. See, you can point the Muslims that Joseph is a foreshadow of Christ. Just as Joseph was sold into slavery, so was Jesus. He was betrayed and he was in prison. He was taken and he was on the cross between two thieves. Isn't that amazing? Joseph was in prison with two men. And one of those men died and the other men lived. Same with the two men, same at the cross. After, I'm sorry, I wrote, okay. One was saved and the other executed. After being humiliated, right? Joseph was humiliated. And in the lowliest of places, he was exalted to the second position in Pharaoh's kingdom. Jesus, he was crucified at the cross, but the Bible says in Philippians that God has given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus and now he is at the right hand of the Father. He is at the right hand of the Father. See, Jesus has been exalted. A wonderful story. Then we have the story of Moses and the life of Moses. Moses was chosen to be the deliverer of Israel. God redeemed them by the blood, as we looked at the Passover, right? From the Passover, the blood, the blood redeemed them out of Israel. God gave Moses the law which revealed God's holy and righteous standard. God's law was given to reveal God's holiness and man's sinfulness. 
Excuse me. <clears throat> and this is a good place where we can talk to them about the law. Because the Bible says that God's law is perfect and holy and just. And God revealed His law and His commandments not to save us, but God gave His law in order to show us our sinfulness. Because the law is just like a mirror. When I go to the mirror, the mirror shows me that my face is dirty. Now, I don't hit the mirror. I don't take the mirror and cleanse my face with the mirror. No, the mirror points me to the water that I need to wash my face. And God's word is as a mirror. It shows me that I am in sin. I am lost. I am in darkness. I am imperfect. I cannot enter the presence of God because the Bible says if you have sinned in one point, you have failed in all. The Bible says you're guilty of all. And so you can ask your Muslim friend, have you sinned more? Have you ever sinned once? Yes. Then you are guilty of all the law. You cannot enter God's presence because you have broken His holy law. But the law was to take us to Jesus. It was pointing us to the cross, that Jesus would come and die, and He would be in our place and take the penalty for our sin. Because the law says, the soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the law was revealed to Moses to point us to Jesus, to bring us to Christ, because Christ alone could redeem us. Then we have the prophet David. David wanted to build a temple for God, but wasn't permitted. God declared to him that one of his descendants would establish an everlasting kingdom. Also that this one, which was referring to the Messiah, would suffer, be sacrificed, and conquer death. You can point again, the Muslim, to David. Do you believe in Dawood? Yes. Do you know that God spoke to David and told him that from him would come one that would be the Messiah? Even David, the prophet David. Then we, we have Jonah. They believe in Jonah. Eunice, the prophet Eunice. Jonah was sent by God to preach his message to the Ninevites, but he refused. God prepared a large fish to swallow up Jonah. He remained there three days and three nights, then back to life. And you can see the words of Jesus because Jesus refers to Jonah. And he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days in, in the belly of the earth. So we can refer back to Jonah. John the Baptist, coming up, John the Baptist, he prophesied of Jesus and declared it, that he was the Lamb of God. So it is important to, to remind your Muslim friend the words of John the Baptist, the words of John the Baptist. And then last, we come to Jesus. Jesus was the Lamb of God, provided as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity, and God was made flesh through Him, fulfilling all the prophecies beforehand in the Old Testament. You see, all of these, all of these prophets that we've been looking at, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Jonah, John, John the Baptist, all of them are pointing to Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We want to take Him down this path so that we can show them that all of the story is pointing us to Jesus. And finally, Jesus rising from the dead, defeated death and hell, then ascended into heaven, coming again to judge the living and the dead. So there you have it. This is the path of the prophets. We looked at the uniqueness of Jesus and his uh, blood atonement and how the Bible throughout all of Scripture tells us that there is no remission of sin except through the blood. And Jesus came to pay for our sins. And so once we understand this, it's important for us to, to learn this and kind of memorize it and understand it, read the stories, get familiar with the Passover, get familiar with the stories in the Old Testament so that you can 
have a conversation with a Muslim. Because one of the things that they, they love is they love hearing stories. But remember, everything, bring them to the gospel. The gospel is central. Okay? All right? Well, we have some time here. Wow, we ended early, 15 minutes. So I'm going to open it up to uh, questions and answers, and then we can pray. So any questions you have? Now's a good time. No, they won't call it the Old Testament. So they would refer to it as the Torah. So you can say the Torah. That's fine. You, you can refer to the Zabur. Okay, so yeah, you can refer to it as the Torah. Yeah. Yes? No, they don't know. Because remember, they don't read the Bible. So they just, once again, so this was... This is something that I wanted to, um, to clarify. The holy books in the Quran, because this was asked uh, previously, they believe that God gave the Torah, the, the Zabur, which is the books of David, the Injil, which is the gospel of Jesus, and the Quran, four holy books. Okay? Now, they don't explain what or how much are those books. It just says God gave four holy books. That's it. Okay, so when, what's that? Well, because remember, they believe that it's been corrupted. Even the Torah. So in their Quran, so all they know when they read their Quran, this is the final word of God. This is perfect. But we believe in the Torah that came before and the Zabur before and the Injil, the, the, Bible, the Bible or the Gospel before. But the one that is now existing is corrupted. So we can't trust it. It's not reliable. So that's why God sent the Quran. So when I'm ministering to a Muslim, though, obviously, deal with one thing at a time. Okay? So if they do, if they come and they say, no, well, you can't trust that. The Bible has been corrupted. Okay, well, let's talk about that objection. The corruption of the Bible. Let's talk about that. Okay, remember, the Quran points to the Bible and says that you must test, test the Quran by the people of the book that came before it. So if it's corrupted, how are you going to test the Quran by something that is corrupt? Okay. So you have different issues that you have to face with them. Yes. No, I have the whole Old Testament and New Testament. Yes. Oh, yeah. New yes. Testament. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I will. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, you can find anything. You can find any. Yeah, you, you can find even thinner than this. Yeah. No, you can find it, but that's why. Yeah, I like to. I will always carry the whole Bible. I don't suggest people carrying just the New Testament. Yeah. Even the fact, even that issue, to me, is a question. Yeah, why, why would they do that? If you think about it, a Muslim could actually drill you and say, well, why do you have a New Testament? Okay, I understand we have New Testaments in our pockets, mm -hmm. but why? It's almost as if I'm saying the Old Testament is not the Word of God. I only need the New Testament. Mm -hmm. That's kind of dangerous. Okay. So I have a Bible. I have a real small Bible, which is the whole Bible, in my pocket. Okay. So they have those two, those, but they're real tiny letters. But you know what? You can carry this. But, I mean, typically, it, it, you know, it depends. If I'm having a... It depends where, I, where I'm at, okay? If I'm at a mosque, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily carry a Bible, okay? I can, I can talk. I can memorize things. I don't necessarily need to have the physical Bible, okay? Um, Yeah. 
So usually when we go to a mosque, normally I'll have a backpack. Women will have bags. So you can have the Bible in there too, you know, or a small Bible. So like I, like I said, I have a small miniature Bible. Yeah, all the time, yep. <clears throat> but I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't recommend people carrying it like this. It's very uh, confrontational. Yeah. Confronta- Here I am with my Bible, you know, I, I don't do that even street witnessing. I don't carry my Bible. And it's something, it's something we do, but I mean, if you think about it in the book of Acts, they didn't have the Bible printed yet. No. The whole church in the book of Acts, they didn't have a Bible. And what did they do? They preached. But we, we have the, the, the benefit or the privilege of having that they didn't have, but I don't have to carry it with me. No, I have it in my heart, in my soul. The Bible, you are the, live, you are the Word of God walking. Yeah, or in the tablets of stone on your hearts, yes. yes. I got one more question, and that's it. That marriage thing, the many wives, is it? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it is practiced. It, it, I mean, I know Mormons do it. You know, Mormons can do it. But I don't know as far as technicalities and legalities. I don't know if it is like in California or what states or which. I don't know. Yeah. And even when I was in Morocco overseas, there are not too many people that actually have more than one wife. It's not a common thing. They can't afford it, yeah. It's... It's... Yes. Yeah, that's fine. And, mo- and most of this, these things are for you to know. Yes, of course. I have almost rarely ever even came up this issue about four wives. No. It doesn't even come up. A lot of things will not come up. There will come up the cross, the trinity, okay, the son of God. Those will be red lights all the time. How about the sacrifice? Uh, is that practiced? And is that at the same time that they do the fasting? Or it's two different things? When they do the, when they do the, the sacrifice of the sheep? Uh-huh. Okay, so first of all, when they kill the sheep, it is not a sacrifice for sin. It is just a memorial. Right, right. So that's all what they're doing. But they do it, and they have to do it. Now, here in the United States, is different than overseas, where they can actually do it at home on their patio and kill a sheep. Here, um, you know, they will go to a, a, a local place here in Chino and different places where the butcher will just give them the meat, and that's it. So they don't necessarily do it themselves. When you go other places and you see them doing it themselves, which is. Do they do it uh, at the same time that they celebrate the, the fast? <coughs> no, it's at a different time. Oh, yeah. So this, this is important for us this year, everyone. May 27th through June 25th is Ramadan. So remember these dates for everyone that you know Muslims. And you may want to, I encourage you. If you go to this website here, www.worldchristian.com, you can order a prayer booklet. And it's, I don't know how much it is. It's very, very minimal. And the prayer booklet, it has every day a devotional and a prayer for that day so you can pray during Ramadan. And this is what a lot of thousands of Christians do all over the world. Yeah, right, for Christians. No, no, no. It's for Christians. Yeah, no. We're Christians praying for the Muslim world. Yeah. Uh, worldchristian.com. World Christian. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's that? Um, it'll be called 30 Days of Prayer. You'll see it. It'll, it'll be called either like Ramadan Prayer Booklet or 30 Days Prayer for the Muslim world. And we want to, you know, we want to pray when, you know, during Ramadan because all the Muslims in the world will be fasting. So, you know, any Muslims you know, you know in, in, during those days, they will not be eating or drinking, nothing. Until sundown. Until sundown, right. Yeah. So also they are very inclined to talk about spiritual things. They're inclined to talk about God, to talk about prayer, to talk about the Bible, to talk about the Quran. 
they will be open because they are, they are fasting. They have to pray, pray and fast. So is that prayer book to go like against their prayers? No, it's a prayer booklet so we know how to pray for them, okay. for the Muslims. So each day has a different topic. It'll say, okay, we're going to pray for, you know, um, the, the spiritual attacks in Nigeria. And now I pray for the Christians in Egypt. Muslim woman, right. what would right. be my first step? The first step is just like you are doing, exactly like you're doing, just smile and say hello or salamu alaikum and see where it goes from there. Okay. You know, Shake their hand if they are willing to shake your hand. I mean, I don't know, are you talking about people that you work at alongside? The oh, at the market, yeah. Oh, you... Yeah, just say hello. Yeah. Just say hello and then leave it at that, you know. You know, if you want to talk more, if you want to ask them, say, how are you? Or, uh, you know, can I ask where you're from? You know, you can start a conversation like that. That's usually how, you know, we would do that. I want to ask them about, like, their food or whatever, you know. To start yeah. A conversation. Have you ever tried? No, I no? want to. I'm okay. a little afraid, but that's Yeah, I'm try here. it. No. Try it. Yeah, try um, it. I have another question, too. Um, um, you know, they were talking about the fact that the Quran is, you know, the last book, which it's not corrupted or whatever. But, right, for the Muslims. Um, it's not a question, it's more like a question that I have. Well, <coughs> do you believe in a God that can keep the word of God without being corrupted? Why would he have to send another another book that is not corrupted? Why can't he keep this one not corrupted? You know what I mean? Like, that's my mentality. That's exactly what we, what we said. Yeah? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah that's exactly the, the issue, is that if the Quran is not corrupted, and yet his previous revelation in the Bible got corrupted, why would he allow it to be changed? Because we have verses in the Bible that say, first of all, God preserves his word. And the Quran says, none can change the words of Allah. So if none can change the words of Allah, then why are these changed? So, yeah, that's what you would bring up to them, and that's what you would say. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Yes. You know what's great? Um, the yeah. more we study about the Muslims and what they believe, the more I see that they kind of steal a lot from the Bible. Like mm -hmm. when Muhammad was saying, the East from the West, separate my sins from oh, the yeah, West. Yeah. Was he, did he know the Bible? Did he read the Bible? You can only, you can only wonder. Right. All you can do is wonder because we know mm -hmm. that he was around Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. We know there was a lot of a trade and he went traveling, you know, by cities. And so he was... And then in Medina, it was a very huge Jewish population. So he would have maybe heard the Torah read. Maybe he would have heard by synagogues and even churches. So he, he couldn't read. <clears throat> he couldn't read, but he could hear. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you have another question? I, no, I wanted to share uh, with this lady here. Yeah. The place where I go work out, um, actually, we have a lot of young women, uh, Muslim women, and um, and I, I talk to them. I mean, we're friends. We work out together. We just kick <coughs> and, and they're very approachable, really. But I never knew how to approach them, like what you know, in yeah. religion, because I feel like, oh, you know, I didn't want to offend them, or but um, this is all going to change. Yes, and you know what? Questions like Ramadan, yeah. you know. Oh, I, I know you're, you're, um, you're practicing Ramadan right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just that, they will be shocked that you know yeah. because nobody knows this. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like Christmas here. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows it's Christmas, okay, because it's everywhere. But for you to tell them, oh, I know you're practicing Ramadan, how does, how does that feel? Yeah. Just that's a simple question. How do you feel? Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Yeah. You know, they will be very shocked. Yeah? yeah actually, four years ago when I used to work, <clears throat> we had a Muslim friend, and because of the Ramadan, that's brought up the conversation. He's the one that brought it up. We went to lunch together, and he noticed it wasn't eating, so we did that. Oh, yeah, you see? Bring your lunch today, and he's the one that brought it up. So exactly. me and my other buddy, we were both Christians, we started talking about it. So, yeah, that does open it up. Oh, totally. 
totally opens it up. And then when you talk to someone about that, then you may end up, because at the end of Ramadan, they have a huge celebration. Mm -hmm. So they may, they may end up inviting you. You may get invited, okay? And then that would be great. Yeah. I ended up a few times at a mosque in, uh, where I lived before in San Gabriel, San Gabriel Valley Mosque. They invited me to come to the mosque for a big dinner, and I was like, yeah, I'll come. So I was the only one there. I was sitting outside with all these Muslims there and stuff, but, you know, I was there. I was a light. You know, whether I got to talk or whether I didn't get to talk, but I, was, I got to be a light, you know, and I was just, I was just there hanging out with them, you know, but they, they invite and they're very welcoming, you know. <clears throat> but it just, it takes a little bit of just kind of breaking the ice, kind of breaking it, you know. Yeah. And you know what? And then not everyone is the same, you know, so there might be some women that you might find a little bit cold, you know, and you just leave it. And then someone else that maybe will respond, you know.